Hello and welcome to My PGCE, a podcast documenting my journey as a trainee teacher with a special focus on mental health. I am your host, James B. Before today's episode, a quick note from the editor. It's me, I'm the editor, so a quick note from me. This episode, as I originally published it, was quite a bit longer. But I realised afterwards that I had a problem with anonymity, so I tried to keep this podcast anonymous as far as I possibly can. But at my new school, which I'm going to talk about in detail this week, several of my colleagues listened to the podcast, which is wonderful. But because they work with me, they know who I'm talking about. And so it's no longer anonymous, not really, not for them anyway. So after publishing the episode, I came to this realisation, unpublished it, and I've now chopped a few things out. But I didn't want to lose the episode completely, because I think there's some good stuff in there. But it just means that now, every so often, it may sound just a tad disjointed. So if you think you've missed something, it's not because you weren't listening, it's because I've chopped it out. So don't worry, and just... Please crack on nonetheless with the episode, because I still think it's worth listening to. And this experience has also made me rethink the format of the podcast. And I haven't yet decided what I'm going to do, but it will be a bit different from here on out. But I hope it will remain interesting, assuming it's been interesting this far. (laughs) and. Hopefully it'll continue to be helpful for those who may struggle with their mental health during their PGCE. Yeah, that's one of the main motivations for this podcast. The first one is to help me reflect on my training. And the second one is to help me reflect on my mental health during my training, which may help other people do the same. Anyway, that was quite a long note from the editor. But without further ado, Here's today's episode. Disjointed at times, though it may be, but I hope you enjoy it nonetheless. Good morning. I hope you've all had a lovely Christmas break and that you've hit the ground running in the first week of this term. So this week for me was a big one. It was the first week of my new placement school, and my first week in the school where I will be a maths teacher next academic year. And it was a week of extremes, which I'll get into shortly. So without further ado, let's kick into the overview. Well, first, quickly, I was thinking last term, of getting rid of the overview section and just having a zooming in section where I talk about the things that I thought were the most important from the previous week. But I think I've changed my mind because I think the overview gives a good overview of what a PGCE student does day to day. So I think I'll keep it for now. But if you find it tedious, or you think I could better use the airtime, then please let me know. So this time, really without further ado, the overview. So Monday is normally spent at university, as you know, doing university things, learning about the theory of teaching. But this Monday was a bank holiday, which I spent doing very little. But on Tuesday, it was my first day in the new school. And it started after we'd gotten our visitors' badges and shown our IDs. It started with a talk from one of the deputy heads, I think, whose name I've now forgotten. I'm quite bad with names. But then also the head teacher. 
Now, I've spoken with the head teacher a couple of times before when I went to visit last term and also when I did my job interview last term. And again, he spoke about his teaching and leadership philosophies, which was as interesting as ever. There was a particular focus this time on student destinations. So what do they want and how do we get them there? Which I enjoyed listening to because I think one of the most important jobs of a maths teacher, if not the most important job of a maths teacher, is to safeguard opportunities for students. And what I mean by that is that if students don't do well, if they don't achieve at least a C or equivalent at GCSE level in maths, then many doors in life close. So a maths teacher's job is to keep those doors open, ensure that they do get at least a C at GCSE. So I liked that. So what the head teacher was saying on Tuesday morning, I think resonated with my personal motivations when it comes to being a maths teacher. I did hear a teacher say during that first session on the Tuesday morning that they'd been at the school for 20 years and that proves just how much they love the school. And while that's a nice sentiment, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not necessarily true. So if you're looking into schools where you might want to get a job and you're trying to find out whether it's a good place to work, if a teacher says to you, well, I've been here for ages, so it must be good. Yeah, it's it's not true in all cases because, of course, a teacher may have stayed at a school for other reasons. You know, they may have commitments in the local area, family commitments or other commitments, which means they can't leave. They may be unable to get a job elsewhere. So what I'm trying to say is, there may be many reasons for which a teacher has stayed at a school for a very long time. It's not necessarily because the school is really good. Anyway, then we had a bit of a tour of the school, which was nice. Then I had a brief chat with my mentor, who, if you remember, was the first person I ever met from this school and the person who made me interested in finding out more about the school and ultimately applying for a job there. Then I observed a year 13 English lesson in the library. And when I walked in at the start and saw the teacher, I knew I recognised her, but I couldn't place her. So I sat down at the back and had to think about it. And normally, if I recognise someone, but I'm not sure where from, it's usually from primary school because it was such a long time ago and people obviously look different then than they do now, you know, given the fact that 20 years has passed in the meantime. So yeah, I thought that I must know her from primary school. That must be it. But anyway, there was a lull in the lesson where the students were getting on with some stuff and she came over and said, you went to, um, such and such primary school, didn't you? And I said, yes, I did. And then she told me her name and all of the memories of her from primary school came rushing back and I could then remember her quite vividly. But I thought this was wonderful. So the very first lesson I observed in my new school uh, was being taught by someone who I went to primary school with. I feel like um, me and her started off in school together in primary school in the same year and many of the same classes, no, no less. We've both gone on these separate journeys and now we're back at school together, which I thought was quite cool. One big circle. So after the English lesson, I observed a computer science lesson, which I will return to in the zooming in section because I think it was the best example of classroom management that I've ever seen. And then last thing on Tuesday, I observed a year 11 Spanish lesson, and it was a streamed lesson. So the teacher is self-isolating due to COVID. She was streaming in via a laptop. She was being projected up onto the uh, whiteboard. She was doing the teaching, 
And then there was another teacher in the classroom. It was, in fact, the same English teacher who I'd met earlier and who I'd been to primary school with. She was also in the classroom, kind of doing the classroom management. That was really interesting to see. On Wednesday, I, first of all, met my new form. So I'm going to be supporting in a year 11 tutor class, which is a nice contrast to my last school, my last placement school last term, where I was in a year seven tutor class. And then first period, I observed for the first time my mentor teaching maths, the deputy head teacher, which again is something I'll return to in the zooming in section because I thought it was the best maths teaching I've seen so far and I'll talk about why. Then I observed a year 10 lesson being taught by the head of department and I thought that she had a very similar energy to my mentor who I'd observed in the previous period. Afterwards, I observed my mentor teaching again, and it was the same class again. And again, I'll talk more about that in the Zooming In section. Segment. I need to get used to calling it segment in the context of a podcast. The Zooming In segment. That's when I'll talk about it. Then, period four on Wednesday, I observed a science lesson. In particular, it was a biology lesson about the structure of cells and at one point the teacher mentioned epithelial cells whatever they are I'm afraid I can't remember but there was a couple of students at the back who turned to each other and said oh we love them which I just thought was wonderful because there's clearly a some sort of story behind that as to why they love epithelial cells so much I'd imagine it must involve the teacher in some way so she's given them a wonderful experience somehow concerning epithelial cells that they've remembered after school on the Wednesday there was year 11 intervention so these are some students they're not necessarily all lower ability students but they're all kind of they're all on a bit of a boundary so they need a bit more support to help them reach their target grade at GCSE. And that was fine. That was with my mentor again. This group of Year 11 students had a sheet to work through, a worksheet, and I um, helped them. And I guess you could say that that was my first experience of teaching, although only in a small group context, but my first experience of teaching in this school. Thursday, I observed my mentor teach again a class on percentages i'll return to that then the head of department teach a lesson where they were running through a booklet an exam style booklet that they'd done or should have done over christmas then i observed a year nine class and this was another example of I think, exceptional teaching, but for a completely different reason. So this teacher has a very different style to my mentor, but it seemed incredibly effective. And so I'll return to that as well in a moment. Then last thing on Thursday, I observed a Year 7 geography lesson where they and I learnt all about volcanoes. On Friday, first thing, period one, I observed a year seven food lesson where we all learnt about fibre and the importance of getting enough fibre in your diet. Then I observed the head of department teaching that year 10 class again and they were again running through another booklet, exam style booklet that they should have done. Then I did a little bit more teaching, but again, it was within a small group context. So there was a year 11 support class 
these are for the much weaker students, I believe, many of whom don't have English as their first language, so that's one of the main barriers there to learning, which I'm not entirely sure how to overcome, so I'd love to hear your suggestions. But yes, again, we had a worksheet to go through, and I worked with a group of four students and helped them convert percentages to decimals and vice versa. Then I had a free where I did some lesson planning for the lessons that I will be teaching next week with that year seven class. And finally had a mentor meeting where we discussed my lesson plans and had a real focus on my explanations, how I was going to explain certain ideas, which was great because, I mean, they those explanations have to be the, the foundation of of any lesson, I think. If I can get those right, then hopefully the rest of the lesson will follow suit. But we will see. And then after school on Friday, it was staff football. So just like my previous school, this school has staff football on a Friday evening, and it's organised and attended by mostly maths teachers. There were a few others, and the standard at this school is much higher. So I think at my previous school, I was one of the youngest, whereas at this school, the teaching staff in general seemed to be younger, and some of them incredibly fit, and some of them really good football players. Well, at least from um, my standard which isn't a very high standard, but still I thought some of them were much better than me. My mentor in particular has got a cannon for a right foot. And at one point when I was in goal, he took a shot and it smacked me square in the centre of my torso. So I saved it, which is great. He didn't score. I won in that particular encounter. But I was winded. I was winded so bad. And I'd, I'd almost forgot that being winded was an experience that human beings can have because it's been so long since I've been winded. But yeah, so I had to take a knee for a few seconds and catch my breath. But anyway, it was great fun. And I think it served the same purpose for me as staff football did at my previous school, where for an hour or so, I just completely forget about all my worries, everything I have to do for my PGCE, and I just focus on chasing a ball around a court. So that was my first week at my new school in Overview. Now I'm going to zoom in. Okay, so let's go with classroom management first of all. The best classroom management I've ever seen came in the computer science lesson the year 11 computer science lesson I observed on Tuesday afternoon, so on my first day. And what do I think made the classroom management so effective here? One thing, maybe the main thing, was that the teacher just had this air of extreme competence. Everything he said was perfectly concise he really knew what it, what he was doing, and it was really obvious that he really knew what he was doing. So, for instance, there was no ambiguity whatsoever in any of his instructions, and so students had no excuse for deviating from those instructions. And if they did, so, in, so I'm thinking of one example in particular. The issue with a computer science classroom is that often the perimeter of the class is lined with the computers. So you have a situation where most of the students are facing their computer screens and not facing the teacher. So the teacher asked them to put their pens down and to have their chairs facing him while he delivered the next explanation. And one student didn't do this. And I think to give the student the benefit of the doubt, just in case he hadn't heard the instruction, despite the fact it was explicitly clear, 
the teacher asked the student again, can you turn your chair to face me, please? And the student, just in typical teenager fashion, like huffed and puffed about it and took his time. And so the teacher gave him a C1. That means a warning. You've been warned straight away. Then the student said something to the teacher, which would constitute talking back, I guess. And immediately was, it was escalated to C2, which means a 15 minute detention at break or lunchtime. And now the student did at last turn his chair to face the teacher. But there was, in those few seconds, 20 seconds or so, there was a real battle of wills here. The teacher wanted the student to do something. The student didn't do it quick enough. The teacher repeated the instruction. Then the student kind of dug their heels in a little bit. Um, it became a matter of pride, I guess. But the teacher won in the end. And he did so, I think, by having explicit instructions, making it perfectly, unequivocally clear what was expected in terms of behaviour and what the consequences would be if his instructions weren't met. So the teacher dealt with it very quickly and the student capitulated in the end. But the student for the remainder of the lesson was very good. And so I think maybe 20 minutes, half an hour later, the teacher went over to the student in private and de-escalated the C2 to a C1. So the student was no longer in detention at break time or lunch time. And the teacher made it clear that this was because he'd been good for the rest of the lesson. And so the teacher was not only addressing poor behaviour when it arised and addressing it immediately, but he was also acknowledging good behaviour. So like I said, I think his classroom management was the best I've seen. And also his subject knowledge was clearly exceptional, as was his pedagogy. And so bringing all that together, it was just, um, I felt like I was watching a masterclass and I learned a lot. I hope I learned a lot. Okay, so that was the best classroom management I've seen. Now I want to talk about the best maths teaching I've seen. And I'm going to talk about two different styles, as I mentioned in the overview. First, the first style is that of my mentor. So what do I think makes him a really good maths teacher? So I've only seen, I think, three lessons of his so far. But something that jumps out at me is he has a very deep understanding of where misconceptions occur and how to preempt them and how to structure examples and questions to highlight these misconceptions. I'm thinking in particular of a percentages lesson where he got the students to increase, I don't know, 50, say, by 10%, and then to increase their answer by 10% again. Then he got them to increase 50 by 20%, and the answer was different. So he's highlighting here the fact that Increasing a quantity by 10% and then by 10% again is not the same as increasing it by 20%. Similarly, he used another example to highlight the fact that increasing something by 10% and then decreasing your answer by 10% won't get you back where you started. And these are really important things to understand early on when learning about percentages so that you don't make mistakes later on. So that was one thing. I thought he also has an exceptional awareness of who's in his class. He knows all the students. He knows which ones require more support. And he also has a great awareness of what each student is doing at any one time. He can tell when attention is drifting and will immediately say, like, stay with me, stay with me, so and so. He'll be on them straight away. He won't let their attention get away from him. Just won't allow it. His questioning is incessant and uncompromising. So even if a student says they don't know the answer, he knows them well enough to know that they do know the answer. 
and just knows that they need more time. Or perhaps he'll move on to question someone else and then return to them. He talks through his own thinking process very clearly and so gives a great example of what it is to think mathematically, gives that example to the students, which hopefully they can then copy. There's a real energy and urgency to his teaching. So when he asks the class to copy down an example, for example, he'll then move around the class at speed, looking at each student to see how they're getting on copying down this example. And if they're not copying it down quick enough, he'll encourage them to copy it down quicker. So there isn't a minute wasted in his lessons. He clearly also has a great understanding of the curriculum and sees his lesson as just one part of a much bigger learning journey, which means he can teach in an adaptive way. For instance, at the end of this percentages lesson, there was some extra time. Now, for me as a trainee, if that lesson had perhaps fallen on a Friday and I'd only planned up to the Friday and hadn't start th started thinking about what I was going to plan for the following week, then I wouldn't know where to go. Or at least I'd have a serious moment of panic trying to think about where to take them, how to use those final few minutes at the end. And there's a high chance that I wouldn't get it right. But he knew exactly where they were going, exactly where they needed to be, all the steps along the way, and so could use those final 10 minutes or so really well. And another thing, when a student gave a wrong answer, he would think very deeply about why the student gave that answer. So something he said in response to one wrong answer, he said, let me just figure out why you think that. He wants to understand where wrong answers and misconceptions and misunderstandings come from so he can preempt it. And I think this links in with his very deep understanding of misconceptions. He really tries and succeeds, from what I can see, to put himself in the student's shoes. Now, on one occasion when we were walking back from one of his maths lessons to the maths office, we bumped into the head teacher. And he asked me how my mentor's lesson had been and I said oh it was fab and I meant that in the truest sense of the word because I, I really feel felt I'd just watched a great lesson but the head teacher said oh no no that won't do that's not how we keep people motivated and aspirational you need to say that there's at the very least room for improvement so just in case the head teacher's listening and just in case my mentor's listening. During the first lesson that I observed my mentor, when he was going through a past paper, they were doing a question on volume and density in the context of mixing liquids, I think. And I think my mentor missed a shortcut. He went through the longer method with which the students are no doubt familiar. And it's no doubt will be the method that they use in the exam. So to be honest, that really probably was the method that he should have been teaching. But I thought that afterwards he could have pointed out a shortcut. Anyway, so there you go, room for improvement, just to appease the head teacher. Okay, so that was the teaching, the maths teaching from my mentor. But I also observed another teacher in the week who had a very different style, but who I also thought was an exceptional teacher. So my mentor is a young man. I think he's a year or so older than me, so he's early 30s. Full of energy, very dynamic, and a real sense of urgency. This other teacher, been in the profession for much longer, uh, is a lady, and 
she's been described by everyone in the department. And I think she would even describe herself in this way as the mother of the department. She's the mum of the department. And she has a very similar dynamic with her students. She cares deeply about all of them. And I think they know it. She knows all about different things that they've been up to, so clearly built on prior conversations she's had with them. When she was greeting students as they entered the room, she was asking them individual specific questions about certain things that they discussed in the past, like, oh, how is so-and-so doing? You said that they were not feeling too well or things like that. She had a really intimate understanding of her students. She was incredibly lovely with them, incredibly caring. And as such, so she actually described her approach when I discussed it afterwards with her as killing them with kindness. And I think maybe that's a bit too utilitarian of a description. It makes it sound like she's being kind because she almost wants to emotion, emotionally manipulate her students into behaving and learning. But I think she genuinely, legitimately cares. You couldn't put on this sort of performance, I don't think, if you didn't genuinely, legitimately care about your students. And the students did behave, and I think they did learn. Because she makes it very clear that she cares about each and every student, and the students know that. They, I think, want to impress her. They want to make her proud. And it also meant that if ever she had to address any poor behaviour, because her default setting is this lovely, caring, nurturing mother figure, if she then kind of became stern for a moment uh, and had to tell a student to not talk over her or something like that, then the difference was night and day. It really meant something to the student, like Mrs. or Mrs. had to to tell me off for it here um I, I really should behave like it's obvious there's no two ways about the fact that she wasn't happy and wanted the student to behave now contrast that with a teacher who starts off too strict they've then got no room to maneuver they've got nowhere to go they start off really strict and a student then misbehaves Maybe they've only got a little bit more strictness in them. And it may not even be distinguishable from the student's point of view. The student may just think, oh, well, the teacher's interacting with me here in the way that they always interact with me. They're strict. They're always strict. But whereas with this teacher, because she's so kind and lovely and caring, when she has to become strict for a moment, it is so obvious. And the student really knows about it. And then they would then very quickly amend their behaviour and the student on this one occasion said oh sorry miss you could tell he really meant it and she then thanked him for his apology and he behaved for the rest of the lesson and she reverted to her kind caring lovely but even when she was being strict you could tell it was coming from a kind caring lovely place I say she was being strict but it was more that she showed that she was disappointed in the behaviour and that it wasn't acceptable and the student got it, and it worked. So I guess that's more about classroom management again. But I think it had a similar effect on the learning taking place in the classroom because all the kids wanted to learn, if not for themselves, they wanted to learn for Miss. They wanted to do her proud. Okay, so that's all the zooming in I want to do this week. What do I talk about next? I talk about my mental health. So I think my anxiety levels have been a bit high this week, um, partly due to the fact that I've been tired. So my sleep routine went to pot over Christmas and I'm yet to sync back up with early bedtimes, early rises, but I'll get there. But yes, so I think my anxiety was a bit higher due to being tired. But 
also, after I first observed that year seven lesson, I worried about that also. And so that maybe stressed me out a little bit and perhaps contributed to not falling asleep at night as soon as I normally would because I was thinking about strategies to deal with this student. But thankfully, I've just recently finished my university essay on maths, anxiety and motivation. And something I learnt during writing that essay was that one of the ways to treat maths anxiety, and I think anxiety in general, is called cognitive restructuring. Now, what does this mean? It's a very fancy way of just saying changing your beliefs about something. It involves reappraising situations. So instead of seeing something or someone as a threat to be avoided, see them instead as a challenge to be overcome. So that's how I'm trying to view this student. I'm trying to view him as a challenge to be overcome. Now, something else I learned whilst writing this essay is that whether you're capable of doing that, whether you're capable of reappraising a stressful situation as a challenge rather than a threat, depends on your confidence. Well, it depends on your self-efficacy, so your confidence in your ability to deal with that situation. And I also remind myself that I got into teaching in general. I decided to train to become a teacher because I wanted a challenge. And it has been challenging so far, but mainly in terms of time management. I'm yet to encounter a really challenging student, yet here he is. And I'm confident that I'll be able to rise to the challenge. If not immediately, eventually I'll get there. I'll figure him out. He's a problem to be solved. And so listening to myself say that is in fact cathartic. It's like a positive affirmation. I can do it and I will do it. Okay, that turned out to be a long episode this week. If you've stuck with me all the way to the end, then thank you. I hope that you've had a good week. I hope that you've faced challenges and that you rose to meet them. And I'll check in with you again this time next week, and I'll let you know how I got on with that Year 7 class. Oh, one final thing before you go. Something bizarre happened yesterday that had me, and has still got me to some extent, questioning my sanity. It was after staff football. I walked to my car, got in my car, messed about on my phone for a few minutes, then turned my car on, put it into reverse to leave, and my sensors started beeping. The reverse sensors at the back of my car that tell me when I'm too close to something, started beeping. I looked out the rearview mirror. I thought there was nothing there. They must be glitching, which does sometimes happen, like a blade of grass will be sticking up, which they pick up. But in fact, there's nothing in my way. So I thought, I'll, I'll just reverse. It'll be fine. It wasn't fine. I hit something. It didn't put up much resistance, but it did make a bit of a screeching sound. Now, before you think that I've run over a student, I didn't run over a student, but I got out my car, went round the back, and there was a traffic cone now wedged under my car, which I tried to pull out and failed, so I had to get back in my car, drive forward in order to release this poor traffic cone. And I don't think any damage was done to the car, so all's well that ends well. But that said... I got back in my car and realised that before I'd gotten in my car the first time, I'd put my bags in the boot. I'd been at the back of my car, putting things in the boot. And so one of two things could have happened. There could have been a traffic cone there that I didn't notice. 
which suggests that I was so wrapped up in my own world that I was completely unaware of even something that's designed to be visible and spotted. I didn't see it, and it was right in front of me at my feet. I didn't notice it. That in itself is worrying. The second more worrying option is that the traffic cone wasn't there. But in the time between me getting in my car and reversing, someone from somewhere put a traffic cone behind my car. But there wasn't anyone anywhere. I was one of the last people to leave the school. This was after Friday night football, so pretty much everyone had gone home. And I was parked in a fairly secluded spot. So yes, either I'm so absorbed in myself that I'm completely oblivious to my surroundings, or someone's out to get me, or at least out to put traffic cones behind my car. In which case, I guess I'm paranoid. It's not good news either way. But I just thought I'd let you know. And should there be any developments, I'll keep you informed. If you like the episode, please spread the word in person and on social media. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at MyPGCEPod or email MyPGCEPod at gmail.com. Please subscribe, rate and review in your directory of choice. Please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash mypgcepod and helping fund both the podcast and my PGCE course. Thank you and talk again soon.